Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Liz Kruger, State Senator for the 28th District. Delighted to be with all of you today for our webinar on new technology to support people with hearing and vision loss, plus a special overview from the MTA on their new Omni payment system, which is relevant for everyone. Um, and I certainly was happy when I learned how to use it. Um, today we have, sorry, quite a group of people who will be presenting. Um, I just want to first welcome you all, and I want to remind everyone that we present all of our webinars um, both on Facebook Live and also on Zoom. And as always, we have closed captioning of today's event. So as a viewer, you have to activate the closed captioning to view the text on your device. If you are on Zoom, click on live transcript in the meeting controls to start viewing closed captioning. And if you're on Facebook Live, you'll see a setting at the button on the bottom right hand corner of the video. Check on CC for closed captioning to activate the process. This forum is being recorded and everyone who RSVP'd will receive an email with links to the event video and the resources that are posted in the chat within a few days, along with the presenters PowerPoints. So don't worry if you don't get every detail and don't think that you have to sit there madly scribbling with a pen to get the information because it's all going to be made available to you afterwards as well. And because we have such a full, full session today, I'm going to skip the part where I do some overviews of what's been happening in Albany, other than to tell you that we, the Senate, officially have ended session. The Assembly is going to go back for a couple of days next week, and we'll soon be sending out from my office um, information about key points from the session. So if you're not on my email list, but somehow you got to this Zoom, um, or presentation, please make sure to add yourself to my um, my listserv on my email system. Doesn't matter whether you live in my district or not. We're happy to send out all information to whoever's interested. And you can do that by going to my website, LizKruger.com, and just typing in your email address. But if you already get emails from me, you're on already. Okay, now we're going to move to today's event. Again, as I told you, this is a roundtable on new technology to support people with hearing and vision loss and an MTA Omni payment system presentation. We're going to begin with Omni at the, through the MPA, which is the new contactless fare payment system for subways and buses and how older people with half care cards can easily use this for trans excuse me, can easily transition to this convenient tap and go system um, with your credit card or with an Omni card. So first we will hear from Alberto Roland, the Assistant Director of Government and Community Relations at New York City Transit, who will give us a brief overview of the program and then take a few questions. Many of you have submitted questions when you RSVP'd, but we will, so we will not be able to get to all of them, unfortunately. Alberto will leave contact information, and if you need additional information about the Omni program, you should contact the MTA directly. After the Omni presentation, we'll move to the main part of our program. First, we will hear from the team from the Center for Hearing and Communication, who will provide information about the services they offer to people with hearing loss, the importance of supporting your mental health by, via hearing, and information about new over-the-counter hearing aids. There's been a lot of technology improvement in, in hearing recently. The presenters from the center will include Michelle DeStofano, the Director of Audiology Services, Jeff Wax, the Director of Emotional Health and Wellness, and Carolyn Ginsberg-Stern, the Director of Outreach and Strategic Services. After the Center for Hearing and Communication presentation, we will hear from the Lighthouse Guild about services for people with vision loss and new technology available to support them. The presenters from the Lighthouse include Lisa Beth Miller, the Outreach and Referral Coordinator, and Dr. Brian Wilnaki, who is the Chief Technology Officer. After the presentations, 
I will moderate a Q&A portion of today's event. And so now to start us off, it is my pleasure to introduce to you, excuse me, I'm getting my text wrong, Alberto Roldan from the New York City Transit. He'll give you a brief overview of the Omni programs and then right after we'll be taking a few questions for him. Good morning, Alberto. Thank you for being with us. Good morning, Senator. Thank you for having us. Uh, always a pleasure to be with the community to discuss an important resource, a new resource that uh, folks are still getting their their um, their hands around, right? Um, so we're going to give a brief overview of what Omni is as a, as a general uh, fare payment system, and then we're going to slide over to the reduced fare portion, how to access that and, and how to transition to that. Um, so here we are. So Omni, what is Omni? Omni, as previously stated, is the new contactless fare payment system that MTA has rolled out. It offers more options for how and where to pay for your fare, and eventually it will replace all payment systems, MetroCard and eTix. So essentially, the goal is with Omni, you can ride the subway, ride the commuter rail, ride the local bus, express bus, etc. One system, one payment system. So it, it, it's eventually going to ease that process of using mass transit along the, not just the city, but the region. So here's our timeline. We began the rollout in 2019, 2020. We've enhanced the digital experience the last couple of years, and we're currently in the expanded fare options, which is the rollout of our reduced fare program. Um, and then next year, tentatively expect to finish the rollout in 2024, but we're gonna continue working that out as, as things progress. How does Omni work? So one option is using your contactless credit, debit, or reloadable prepaid card. You tap our, our Omni screen at the subway or the bus. Essentially, it's like tapping the, the pin pad for your Target order or your Starbucks order, similar concept. You just tap and you can, it takes your payment, you go in, or you can set up a digital wallet on your um, mobile device or your smartwatch or other wearable um, device. And lastly, if you want a physical card, you can load an Omni card before you travel. You can buy a new Omni card or reload at one of our existing retail locations or online as well. Um, we can go through that later on in the presentation on how that works. So some of the benefits is contactless, so no more swiping. Weekly fare capping, which we'll go through as well. You can also, for the first time, create an online account and manage your your Omni account. You can see um, where if you've used it, what your balance is, if you have a physical card. If you lose your card, you're able to suspend it and get a new one, those types of, of, of um, options that we don't have now uh, with the Metro card. You also have free transfers. That's still, that's still an item. And at, lastly, the cards are more durable. Metro cards only last a year. These new cards last up to seven years, which is a great, a great difference. It, it's greener um, and it's also uh, more efficient so how to tap in your Omni, your Omni card. On the left, you have the main screen before you tap. You see that on the buses and, and the and turnstiles. The first green with the arrow pointing left, that's when you tap on the bus. It, you tap and you make it left onto the bus. The third is subway, which you see in the subway. And then lastly, if you do not tap correctly, you get the big red tap again sign. So why are we here? Essentially to discuss a new way to pay for your subway and bus using the contact this card, smart device, or wearable you already have. So essentially, the old joke is you can pay for your pay for your fare using the same device you use listen to Spotify or watching Netflix all together. So that's like a neat thing we have now at Omni. So kick, kick it off to my colleague, Javi Levine, who will talk about switching over to reduced fare Omni. Hi, everyone. Can everyone see me? Perfect. So just to talk a little bit more specifically about reduced fare on Omni, I think that's a lot a question that a lot of people have been asking. So right now, um, you reduced fare, you know, if you have reduced fare, you know who you are, you get half price off the fare. So right now it's 135 for a ride on subway or bus. Um, and so that is available. So right now on Omni, we'll get into that in more detail. But before you make the switch to Omni, of course, you have to be accepted into the reduced fare program, um, which you know is for seniors or people with qualifying disabilities. So 
there's two things. So right now, you know, Omni as tapping your smartphone or your dedicated credit card, your credit card or debit card that's your own personal card right now is how you can use Omni. But we will have an Omni card that will be dedicated and just for Omni as MetroCard is today. And so if you take no action right now, you never think about this again. At some point in the future, we will be MetroCard will be going away and we'll be moving to Omni and you will get in the mail a reduced fare Omni card that will, you know, be have no balance on it. You'll need to add money to it, but we'll have your reduced fare encoded onto it so you won't have to apply again or anything like that. Um, it will be all ready for you to go. Um, so to make sure that does happen, you know, as you would like it to, do make sure if you haven't talked with us recently, talk to our customer service team to make sure your mailing address, other content information is up to date um, to make sure that OmniCard does reach you in the mail. However, today you can sign up if you are interested and use Omni with your reduced fare benefits, so only paying the reduced fare on your own phone or credit card, debit card, um, as long as it's contact list. And so the main way we have to help you sign up for that is you can go to our website, um, omni.info, and use this digital assistant, which is at the bottom right of the screen as you sign into the main website. And so as soon as you click on that, it will look like this. Um, and it's a little chat box that will walk you through the process, ask you for information from your current Metro card, your, your number, things like that. Um, and you need to create an account as well on our Omni site to do this. So, you know, understand that not everyone's going to want to do that, but this is the process for if you want to use your own phone or personal card. And so this digital assistant is screen reader accessible. We have customer support available and we'll, we'll give you the number for that as well as the email on the next slide. Um, and we have assistance in person locations as available by end of the year, but that's actually available now at our customer service centers um, throughout the city and we'll list those locations as well. So as mentioned, you know, contact us. Um, you can submit questions online at omni.info slash contact, or you can give our dedicated Omni customer service center a call and that number is right there and, and we can put that in the chat and everything later at the end of the presentation um, but open seven days a week eight to five um, help you walk through this process as well as any other questions you have about Omni your account charges anything like that as well and that's dedicated specifically to Omni So in terms of visiting us in person, and this, these are our new customer service centers. You can see one here in the photo. Um, you know, they look, they're similar to our booths we have today, but just, you know, a little, uh, a little better decorated, I would say, with some nice lights and decals um, to make clear that these are customer service centers. And so those are located. We have our customer service center that's been in existence for many, many years at Three Stone Street in Lower Manhattan. But these, you know, are, are throughout the five boroughs at Penn Station, Yankee Stadium, Atlantic at Barclays, um, Coney Island, Flushing Main Street, Fulton Street, um, Jackson Heights in Queens, Myrtle Wyckoff, as well as St. George and Staten Island. So those are all places where you can come ask any Omni questions and also make this transition if you want to do it in person without the digital assistant from reduced fare Metro card to reduce fare Omni on your own phone or credit card. So another option for doing this is this same, you can make that same swap at the customer service centers, also at our mobile sales vans and buses um, that make monthly stops throughout the city and a variety of different neighborhoods. Um, and they can also help you with your reduced fare application, um, transferring Metro card balances between full fare and reduced fare, um, exchange damaged Metro cards, sort of everything they do today. If you're not, you know, familiar with that as well as the Omni switch. So, you know, reporting a lost card and then asking any questions generally are, are all available at these vehicles as they have been for, for many years. So... Yeah, we kept our presentation brief so we can have time for Q&A and I'll turn it back over for that. Great. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, we have many questions that again, we won't get to, but for everyone watching, you've got the, and on your chat and when we send you out the email, you'll have the information about how to call or email um, 
the New York City Transit as well. Um, but just a couple of the questions I don't think you got to in your presentation. Um, when you use Omni with your credit card, when you get your monthly statement, is every time you swipe at a bus or subway going to show up as a separate bill on your statement, or they'll just be one monthly fee charged to, I don't know, Omni or New York City Transit? How do we track this stuff for ourselves? Yeah. So it'll be, so every every transaction will be shown there as a transaction so you'll be able to see how many times you've used it in a day of course if you have a free transfer you won't be charged for that and that will you know be rectified on the back end so you'd still see the one 275 you know charge even if you took a subway ride and a bus ride um within about two hours so um so it'll be separate. And if you do want to track, you know, exactly where you're going and anything like that on Omni, you can make an Omni account and you can see, you know, exactly where you swiped in. And so you can remember exactly where you were going, what you did that day on, on Omni. So now the there's a there's an autofill option for seniors with their Metro cards where just more money is downloaded into the card automatically. Um, through having your credit card account on account. Is that option going to still exist? How will that work? Yeah. So if you use your own phone or credit card, of course, it sort of automatically kind of removes one of the steps here and just automatically takes it off your, your payment, your preferred payment method. Um, but if you're using the dedicated Omni card, that option will still exist. You'll still be able to connect your own card and have it autofill if you want to use a dedicated Omni card, of course. Um, and in terms of, you know, making the switch, if you have an an easy pay omni or easy pay metro card today um do contact us because you know as i think has been mentioned in in forums before you know if you want to stop using your metro card as soon as you try and use the balance down it'll just refill so if you do want to close that out you do need to contact us so we can you know stop that process and, and refund you any remaining balance on an easy pay metro card but again, for now, if you want to just keep using your Metro card, however you've been using it, that's going to continue for you, right? You don't have to change over now. Correct. There's no need to take any action today if you like what you're doing and you just want to wait for a dedicated Omni card. Great. And does, so we know it's the swipe or tap system. If you have a credit card, what if you have a debit card? Do those work also? Yep. Debit cards work the same way. Apologies, just using a bit of shorthand saying credit card, but credit and debit card work the same way. Great. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Will Omni eventually affect those of us who have accessoride Metro cards? Um, and how is that going to work? So right now, Omni for accessoride, we're building up to a pilot program. Um, this summer that'll, you know, make sure that Omni on Accessoride goes smoothly, but we're hoping everything will work well and it's possible that you'll have one card that will work as your Accessoride ID as well as have um, any other fares or free rides you have on, you know, fixed routes of bus or subway as well. And so it'd be a great improvement um, for those of you who use Accessoride, won't need to carry cash if you don't want to and things like that. But that's right now developing a pilot and we'll be coming a little later. So for people who, you know, use the subway a lot and get the monthly card, how does that translate into Omni? So, Berto, you want to take that? Yeah, yeah. So so good question. So currently we're, we're evaluating um, different fare, fare uh, uh, options, but we presently have fare capping. So essentially starting Monday through Sunday, after you take 12 rides with the same form of payment, it'll be free rides through that Sunday. So after 12, it's free. Um, so that's what we currently have in terms of unlimited ride program. Um, but again, we're still evaluating other options as we go forward. So that made, yeah, go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna add, Senator, apologies. That, so the real benefit of that is that you don't need to decide at the beginning of a week whether you're gonna be riding enough times to make it worth it to buy a weekly card. You can just 
you know, tap Omni. And if you hit, you know, what now is some marketing, we've talked about lucky number 13. Once you hit 13, it, everything after that is is free, essentially. It's as if you did buy a weekly, but you don't need to make the decision at the beginning of the week. And that's built into Omni automatically, both that full fare and reduced fare right now, if you do make the switch and use your own phone or debit or credit card, you will benefit from that weekly fare capping. And that probably all explains someone else's question. Um, they believe that if you switch to Omni, you'll automatically get charged for 12 rides every week. But, but I believe it's more if you already have 12 rides a week, then the rest are free for the remainder of that week. Is that correct? Yep. After 13 rides, everything yeah. else is, is free. Got it. Okay. Um, so, quote, I like my senior easy pass can i add a certain amount of oh sorry like my existing senior easy pass can i add a certain amount of money to the omni card um and then just have it there on account the same way you do with easy pass so omni um a dedicated omni card can work just like easy pay today where you have it automatically you know add value when you're below a certain level it can also work like a standard metro card where you know you have a, a just set number of dollars and as soon as you run out it'll let you know at the turnstile and you'll you'll go add add value at one of the what will be new omni vending machines that will replace the metro card vending machines we have today so some people are very very sensitive about privacy rights and their credit cards and people having hacked their cards and used them for other purposes. You know, we've all had that experience where suddenly a bill comes in and you know you didn't buy $900 worth of balloons in Cincinnati because you've never been in Cincinnati. Um, so how are we protecting people's both privacy rights and not being hacked by people who are trying to get access to their credit cards through the Omni system? Yeah, so so the Omni system, when you tap, it, it's encrypted data. So it's not a free system for folks to just hack. Um, so it's protected and it's also, um, you're not identified based on you using your card. So none of that is released to us or the system itself. Uh, how we want to add anything to that? I would just say that, it, you know, if you're using your, your contact list, credit or debit card or phone right now at, at a drugstore or CVS, anywhere that you use it today, you know, we're meeting or exceeding all the same security standards that any other store doing this is. And this is, you know, a technology that's continuing to, to be implemented and rolled out, you know, throughout the city and the country. And I'm understanding that they're not going to be selling Omni cards in subway stations. Um, so concerns about getting access to them, particularly for tourists, um, to New York City, what are we doing about that? So, so we're expecting to roll out the physical machines and stations later this summer. But presently, you're able to uh, purchase them at various retailers such as local drugstores and all that. We do have an online retail locator um, where you can type in your address and find the nearest one to you. And those locations will also be where you can refill them as well. Yeah, and, and Senator, if I can add, yes. it's um. I think where maybe that question comes from is you can't you can't buy a reduced fare Omni card right now at any store or any vending machine because we have to track that and align it with your account. But for full fare Omni cards, if you have a family member or someone coming into town, um, you'll be able to buy that at the vending machines or at any a variety of a large number of stores Alberto mentioned. Great. Well, we have actually like finished almost exactly on time with the questions and you two gentlemen. So I want to thank you both for being with us. Again, your contact, the information is on your chat. If you have other questions you want to follow up with New York Transit about, um, and again, it will all be coming in the materials you get in a couple of days from us. So thank you both for joining us. Appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, Thanks, Senator. Senator. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to um, the Center for Hearing and Communication, as I mentioned before, uh, Michelle, Jeff, and Carolyn, and they will be sort of passing it off to each other. Um, and they're going to be talking about all the new innovations um, in hearing issues. So take it away. I guess it's Michelle first. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen. 
give me a second. Okay. Just make sure I'm staring the right one. Okay. okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Carolyn Stern, and uh, I manage outreach initiatives like the one today, as well as a few other community initiatives throughout the city for the Center for Hearing Communication. And um, today we're going to be talking about our hearing, OTC hearing aids right for you and mental health and hearing loss. This is our agenda. Uh, we, I will talk a little bit about the center. We would like you to know about who we are and so that we can be a resource for you. And then Michelle DiStefano, our director of audiology, will come and talk about the basics of hearing loss and will really delve into the topic of OTC hearing aids. Our objective is to really empower you with a lot of information and good information so that you can make a good decision for yourself about if this technology is right for you, and also how CHC can help you on this journey. And then finally, Jeff Wax, our Director of Emotional Health and Wellness, will join and speak about the topic of mental health and hearing loss. This is a common issue for many people coping with the condition, and we have a lot of expertise in this area. So Center for Hearing Communication is uh, a nonprofit hearing health organization based in New York City, and we have a location in Florida as well, in Fort Lauderdale. Um, we are physically located in Lower Manhattan on 50 Broadway. We offer services in person and remotely. And our mission is like the essence of our organization is to provide high quality, comprehensive services in order to help uh, people affected by hearing loss, deafness, and listening challenges so that they can have communication without limits. We work with people um, of all modes of communication, whether it's spoken or they prefer to sign, and we work with all ages. We take a very comprehensive holistic approach and um, you'll see on the right-hand side of the slide is we have several departments that support an individual and family members <laughs> living with the hearing loss. We have an audiology department that provides hearing testing and a slew of other very useful and helpful um, services that Michelle will share with you what her team does. We have a speech and language department that has experts that are trained in um, communication, listening, and um, speech production skills for individuals, their speech pathologists, and we offer programming for children through adulthood. And then we have the emotional health department, which Jeff will speak about. And I wanted to also share with you that we have a very strong education and family resource center that can provide guidance for families um, that have hearing loss with uh, their children, their infants, or young adults, young teens or young adults and they can serve as a resource for you. So I just wanted to conclude and um, just let you know that Center for Hearing Communication is a, uh, available for you to be a resource. Uh, if we're reachable to get to from your area, great. If not, we are available to answer any questions you may have digitally through email, through our website. So check out our website. Uh, hopefully you will find the information that you need um, there as well. So I'm gonna invite Michelle to join us now to uh, talk about the topic of OTC hearing aids and general information about hearing loss. Good morning all, I'm just gonna to go to the next slide. Um, so just to discuss a little bit about hearing loss, um, it's common for older adults to have some degree of hearing loss, similar to how your vision can change. So can your hearing. It's typically considered a permanent hearing loss that occurs 
um, from the inner ear or from the hearing nerve, and often is in the high pitch. High pitch sounds are women's voices, children's voices, um, how you hear in background noise and that clarity of speech when you're in social situations. Um, so you'll often hear people with hearing loss say that they have trouble hearing in restaurants, family gatherings, uh, out to dinner with friends. There, we do know at this point that untreated hearing loss can increase the risk of cognitive decline or dementia or Alzheimer's, the risk of falling. We do know that your balance system is in your ears, so that can happen. And we also know it can increase the risk of depression. If you have any um, of those the conditions listed on the slide, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, or even prediabetes, kidney disease, or osteoporosis, you are at a higher risk for hearing loss. There are treatments for hearing loss, including hearing aids, cochlear implants, and other assistive devices if you're just not ready for hearing aid, um, things that can help amplify your telephone, television, <coughs> excuse me, um, and other accessories you can use. Hearing, tech, hearing aid technology has really come a long way, especially in the last few years, um, allowing for uh, rechargeability. You don't need to change batteries. You can stream from a cell phone, tablet, anything with Bluetooth. The remote programming is available at this time, so you don't necessarily have to come into a center. We actually can program hearing aids remotely. And of course, over-the-counter hearing aids. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So over-the-counter hearing aids were launched in the fall of 2022 officially. Um, they have been discussed and on the table for years before that, but they were officially ruled in 2022. They are considered a self-fitting category, which means that you do not uh, use a professional or an audiologist to program them for you. You program them yourselves. They are regulated by the FDA and they are for perceived mild to moderate hearing loss. That's a key word, perceived. You do not have to have a hearing test in order to obtain over-the-counter hearing aids. CHC recommends you do have an official hearing test because it's difficult to know what your hearing degree is and how much you perceive of a loss. Um, typically, if you have a mild to moderate hearing loss, you hear okay in one-on-one -on -one conversation, but from a distance, someone from another room in restaurants, noisy environments, you have some difficulty. And they are only for ages 18 and older. They are not for children. Next slide. So over-the-counter hearing aids are available online or in retail, places like Amazon, Walmart, um, Best Buy. They do not require a hearing test or a prescription the way prescription hearing uh, aids do, although I will say, we, again, strongly recommend you at least have a hearing test to get a baseline of what your hearing is and to know your needs. Most products will typically require a smartphone or a tablet for setup and controls. And it's always important to check the return policy and warranty. For prescription hearing aids, there is a New York State return policy of a minimum of 45 days where you can uh, purchase your hearing aid and then return it. And most prescription hearing aids come with a warranty. There is no real regulation at this point on over-the-counter hearing aids as far as return policy or any repair or loss warranty. Return policy is what we're seeing is typically going similar to that of the agency that you purchase it from. So if you buy it online from a store, it goes follows that return policy. Next slide. So how do you know you're not an over-the-counter uh, hearing aid candidate? Um, there's a few things. If you have any uh, symptoms like tinnitus, which is the ringing, hissing, or buzzing in one or both ears. If you have better hearing in one ear over the other, a good way to tell that is do you often switch the telephone? Do you um, lay on one side and you can't really hear the television as well as if you lay on the other? If you have any pain in your ears, any fluid, any discharge, a history of ear infections, um, if you're somebody who gets excessive wax, if you have any dizziness, imbalance, or vertigo, that room spinning sensation, 
Or if you notice there, you have a sudden hearing loss, you wake up one morning and you aren't hearing as well out of one ear. Those are all the medical reasons, but we've found some of the other reasons that you may want to um, hold off on pursuing an over-the-counter hearing aid and perhaps discuss with an audiologist. A prescription hearing aid is if you're not so tech savvy, if using your iPhone or your Samsung is difficult for you, um, checking email is a difficulty, you may not want to pursue this because you do need to be proficient in a, a smartphone or tablet. If you don't own a smartphone or tablet, quite a few people don't. If you don't own a phone that has Bluetooth, if you have limited dexterity, if it's difficult for you to manage or clean or um, change batteries on anything, you don't necessarily want to get them. And if you require hands-on assistance and don't have somebody that can be with you to assist with that. Next slide. Um, so hearing aids and optimal fit. This is an important thing. Similar to perceived hearing loss, you don't always know what your best hearing ability is. So studies have shown that you don't accurately determine your not only your hearing loss or what you need to hear well, because it's difficult to know what you're missing. So you'll likely fit a hearing aid yourself based on comfort and not necessarily the optimal um, access that you need in order to hear well in background noise in social situations. You don't necessarily know how much you're missing. So you're going to always want to at least go to an audiologist to guide you on that optimal fit. Next slide. So the cost of over-the-counter hearing aids versus prescription hearing aids. Now, when I say prescription hearing aids, that means you've seen an audiologist, you've had a hearing test, and the audiologist is discussing hearing aid options with you. At CHC, we often discuss both options if you are a candidate based on your hearing loss and your needs. Over-the-counter hearing aids are anywhere from $700 to about $19.95 a pair. Um, they are as the technology is changing and they're adding more technology into the hearing aids. So typically they were just amplifying sound. Now there are some that filter background noise, the higher the cost is becoming. Um, they may not have streaming capabilities, which means you may be able to program them from your Bluetooth phone or tablet, but you cannot answer phone calls from them. You cannot um, control them with an app on them and you may not necessarily be able to like listen to music, audiobooks from them. And they typically do not have any loss or damage warranty. They do have repair warranties and that varies. There are some mail order uh, hearing aids and one or two over the counter more advanced hearing aids that may offer some remote audiologist report, uh, support. Then there's prescription hearing aids. Prescription hearing aids can run um, anywhere between $1,800 to about $6,500 per pair. Um, again, they are can be rechargeable. They're programmed to your prescribed hearing loss by an audiologist with computer software. Um, you get counseling on the device care and maintenance of the hearing aids. You get supplies to maintain the hearing aids. You get um, regular checks to determine the benefit of the hearing aids. So typically you're tested in a booth with them on. There's devices and computers we use to verify that they're giving you the optimal hearing you need. You can stream audiobooks and phone calls. Important, I just wanna um, note, you can use a prescription hearing aid without having Bluetooth or use your cell phone or tablet. You don't have to do that. They function independently on their own an extra perk is you can answer phone calls, listen to audiobooks. Not the same for over-the-counter hearing aids. You must have something with Bluetooth in order to program them at all yourself. Um, they come with typically prescription hearing aids come typically with a three-year repair warranty, a loss and damage warranty that it will get replaced if lost or crushed. And um, we get asked this often is does Medicare cover hearing aids? At this time, they do not. Most managed um, Medicaid programs and most uh, insurances will cover hearing aids, if not some portion of the hearing aids. Um, and so you, you would always want to check that first. They do not typically cover over-the-counter hearing aids or some that may necessarily, you know, be purchased through like a Costco. Um, and then you always get the audiologist expertise to ensure that the hearing aids are programmed uh, optimally and that you're getting the maximum benefit. I often say a hearing aid is only as good as the person who's programming it. So it's important to think of that. 
Um, Over-the-counter and prescription aids come in two different styles, completely in the ear, and I'm sure people have seen those, and the ones that go behind the ear with a little wire. Next slide. And I just want to note that in the um, chat, there is some links to some uh, to our website and some other sites that do discuss over-the-counter hearing aids. It's a lot of information to cover. Um, and we do have in our appendix, there's some of the styles and um, audiograms that show what your hearing loss can look like as you get older. So are you ready for an over-the-counter hearing aid? So some things to consider. Does your hearing loss fall within that mild to moderate range? And how do you know that? Is it just based on what you think? Or do you go get a hearing test to get a baseline and know? Is your hearing loss in both ears and the same in both ears? Um, is your hearing issue complex? So what that means is sometimes people don't just need volume. Volume may make things more clear and it sounds better, but if you're watching television, you make it louder and you're still having trouble making out what's being said, your issue isn't volume. Your issue is clarity of speech. And then you would uh, need a prescription hearing aid. Um, can you handle the technology on your own? Are you tech savvy? Are you able to adjust things? Are you able to handle even um, your, a laptop easily? And do you want any assistance in person? Over-the-counter hearing needs don't necessarily give you that in-person assistance. At CHC, we are offering some assistance for over-the-counter, um, but it's not uh, typical. Next slide. Um, so in summary, over-the-counter hearing aid tips. This is some things that are really important. As an audiologist, I feel you need to know. You want to get tested to know if you officially are a candidate. How do you really know what you're hearing and what you're missing unless someone actually tests your hearing? You want to always read the label and the warning signs. Make sure they are actually FDA approved. The FDA approved over-the-counter hearing aids must have them labeled on their packaging. Um, you want to make sure that you know the repair and warranty policy and the return policy. You want to give yourself some time to adjust and try it out. And over the counter might be perfectly good for you, but it's not going to sound uh, instant and automatic. So it's not like reading glasses. You put them on, everything's magnified. You're great. Your brain does need some time to adjust to the change in hearing and those sounds that you weren't hearing before. And you can always engage an audiologist for any assistance. It's important to um, reach out if you're not sure. And an audiologist should be willing to do that for you. We definitely are at CHC. You can go to the next slide. Um, we do have free over-the-counter consultations at CHC. You call up, you say you've had a hearing test or you need a hearing test. It can be scheduled with us. Medicare does cover hearing tests. It does not cover hearing aids, but it does cover the evaluation for your hearing. Um, and you can get a free 15-minute phone consultation with an audiologist to discuss over-the-counter candidacy options that are there, things that are available. Um, I would just like to enter uh, into at this point on the slide. If you're newly diagnosed with a hearing loss, the options can be very overwhelming and what to do next can be very overwhelming. And um, I strongly feel the role of the audiologist is to just help you on your hearing journey. We're there to really make sure that you get to be able to interact and communicate the way you should in your life. And so even if you are having uh, have a newly diagnosed hearing loss and you're not sure what the next step is, feel free to call. Our audiologists are always available to answer questions. Um, you can email. Uh, we have it on our website, an Ask the Expert. Uh, link, and we're happy to answer and guide you. That's our job. Um, and, you know, you want to always consider looking for guidance in places like CHC. We're a nonprofit organization, a uni teaching university that has audiology, perhaps a hospital that would be able to give you um, guidance and not necessarily sales. Um, and that's just my little soapbox for a bit there. Um, and like I said, we do have further information in the appendix. Next slide. Next slide. And
I'm on. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. Um, so my role, and I love to uh, uh, present with my colleagues, um, not only are they wonderful, but also at CHC and in my work, uh, perspective about work, um, is that we, we, we see people, the whole person. Uh, you are not, you are full people. Uh, our clients are fully engaged people in lives and work and social life and family life, et cetera. And uh, hearing loss can definitely be a part of that life. But we, we look at, and in my department, the Emotional Health and Wellness uh, Center, um, people come to us uh, because they're having difficulties and having some form of distress about life, maybe life in general, but certainly life as it impacts uh, when, you have it, when you have a hearing loss. Um, I'm the director of the, uh, of the center. Uh, all my staff, uh, we're psychotherapists. We have a psychiatrist on staff. We have a psychologist on staff. And uh, basically the process is, uh, you know, people get referred to me. Uh, uh, we see people of all ages from, I think our youngest now is about five. Our oldest, I believe is 96 and still engaged in a therapy, a psychotherapy process. So in my office, we talk about everything, but certainly we know the impact and the emotional impact uh, when people are dealing with a hearing loss. Uh, just for your information, we also, in my department, we're also all fluent in American Sign Language. So we see people who are uh, in the deaf community and communicate through American Sign Language, as well as people, of course, who use speech as uh, the main mode of communication. Um, so we do help people, hopefully, help people manage their concerns and some challenges in, in their lives. Um, you know, depending on one's life circumstance, uh, hearing loss can feel quite traumatic. Uh, and there's a process, whether it's a sudden hearing loss or happens over time, there is an adjustment. There's an adjustment that happens over time, uh, a lifestyle adjustment, and it can be very challenging, certainly can be very challenging. There's kind of a rebuilding of life uh, in that adjustment. And one reason the impact of hearing loss can really make one feel quite different um, I've heard people use that phrase, I feel like I'm a different person. We work to support that you're the same person, you're even maybe a better person, <laughs> but, we, but, but the looking at that impact and that feeling. I'm a psychotherapist, we deal with feelings, right? So there's this kind of uh, rebuilding of life and certainly how people cope with hearing loss. Um, and again, hearing loss doesn't happen in a vacuum. Hearing loss happens with, the, with life all around you, right? Your life all around you. But there are, as, as this slide indicates, uh, you know, a range of emotions that people feel, uh, frustration and anger and sadness, stress, anxiety, depression, uh, earlier, the slide that, that was up that Michelle mentioned that uh, having a hearing loss uh, can increase a risk of depression. And I think that is, that is true. Uh, but just to state the obvious, uh, it's about the impact of the life around you and how we react to it. Life happens, we have an emotional reaction. And it's the emotional reaction in our work that we try to shift and make it as positive and as stable a reaction as we can. Um, and of course, these, these emotional experiences don't happen only because of a hearing loss, right? I mean, we're all human. We're not immune to life's uh, ups and downs. And we feel sad or frustrated or angry or stressed for lots and lots of different reasons. And, uh, coping mechanisms and learning how we cope the best we can uh, 
in dealing with those, uh, the impact of those emotional situations. People uh, at the top of this slide, people do experience, uh, I've had people tell me that everyday life experiences can be really frustrating. Going into a store, uh, communication, it's a communi big, big time communication issue that might be really obvious, but we're so used to it, or if we're used to a smoother communication with, with not too many distressful feelings, uh, it, can be, it can be frustrating. People can feel, you might feel criticized, you might feel angry, you might feel annoyed, especially a very common experience people have is feeling annoyed at other people who don't believe them when they say they have a hearing loss. And it's uh, something that I could either go, really, you know, why wouldn't people believe you? But it is, is in fact, a very common experience. So people can then feel quite diminished, you know, not paid attention to, not cared about. Um, people in the world, the world can be an unkind place. It can be harsh. Uh, and we feel the impact uh, overtly or sometimes just subtly. Um, and we can feel insulted, we can feel put down. And like I say, that feeling of feeling, feeling quite diminished. Very common people with hearing loss are is fear. Will the hearing loss worsen? Uh, people feel embarrassed. People feel the, the these questions of, of everyday life. Can I go to the theater? What will it be like around a dinner table or at a restaurant or movies? Social life, right? Relationships can become kind of strained uh, for any couple. Uh, if one person has hearing loss and the other doesn't, it can be complicated to adapt to that. Uh, you can also feel very tired. Uh, I hear this constantly. Why am I so tired? And part of the reason is that there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of effort and energy put forth when we are listening and when we are trying to hear something. It, it can be quite exhausting. So all of that, everything I just said, it's kind of like, uh, right? It's kind of like, uh, I don't want to feel that. I don't want to be in that mood of frustrations and anger and stresses. And I don't want you to believe that just because one might have a hearing loss that you're destined to live in those kinds of intense or less intense moods, um, uncomfortable moods, right? No. And in my work, we really try to connect and promote all of the strengths that I believe you have. I have never met all of you, right? But we do have emotional strengths that we have and where we try to challenge that, uh, I'm sorry, channel that into creating emotional hearing, uh, emotional healing, sorry, I'm stumbling a bit, emotional healing around uh, the issues of hearing loss and, and shifting the pathways of, uh, of health and healing. So if we can do the next slide, please. Uh, living and coping with hearing loss. Um, and when I counsel my clients, I, I definitely offer and try to encourage these, uh, which, I'll, which I'll briefly describe, um, these mechanisms, these practices I call as a way of dislodging or loosening any kind of negativity, negative emotional patterns that we pick up or that we have already. And these are some, some of the su suggestions. Um, first, be the author of your own journey. Uh, life is a journey and you are in charge as best you can be and the things that you can control uh, of your journey. And my belief is that we are perfect people. That doesn't mean humans are perfect people. We all have flaws. We are imperfect at best, right? But our hearts, in our hearts, we are perfect people. And uh, I encourage to find out what is in the way, what gets in the way of being that kind of uh, believing that and creating that for yourselves. Turn the prism 
and discover new perspectives. So what I mean is that we, we tend to look at things in one way, or we get rooted into looking at things in one way. And I like the image uh, of if we have a prism and we turn it slightly, right? A prism and refracts the light differently as you, as you turn it. And we can discover new perspectives. Um, and new perspectives, I, I believe, and I try to put forth, that they create new choices, which is really essential to creating more safety, emotional safety and control in our lives. The third thing, build your connections. Uh, make positive connections to friends, families, allies at work. Foster wellness, practice self-care in whatever way that is meaningful for you, a meaningful endeavor. That might be yoga, that might be meditation, that might be going for a walk, that might mean shopping, that might mean leafing through a magazine or knitting, cooking, anything that gives you pleasure. Find purpose and be curious. Cultivate compassion for yourself uh, and embrace healthy thoughts. Live through the feelings. It's challenging. If we know we have fears, we don't want to dive into the fire of fears. But ironically, when we go through the experience, the distressing experience, hopefully and most often we come out more whole, we come out with the fears uh, lessening, dissipating. Um, and seek help. Of course, if you feel really stuck, if you feel overwhelmed, seek help, call me uh, if you'd like. <laughs> um, our our uh, contact information, of course, will be provided. And uh, of course, it's don't seek help only with me, but seek help for the uh, in your lives. And uh, whether that's in a therapy, a psychotherapy process, or some other process, um, get supports, get support. So I thank you so much. I thank you so much. Uh, we do have this weekly support group for people with hearing loss, and that's open. And please contact Contact me for, if you'd like to come in, it's a drop-in group. Right now it's on Wednesday nights at 6.30 on, uh, online, I mean, uh, over, over Zoom. And we offer the main, the main part of our uh, program and the Emotional Health and Wellness Services is psychotherapy for individuals, for families, for couples, uh, for people, uh, did I just say it's families, families uh, with, with or without hearing loss can also, uh, participate in our uh, in our service so thanks so much thank you very much thank you all three that was very informative and now we're going to jump to our last presenters who are lisa beth miller and dr brian wolniski from the lighthouse guild who will share information about available supports for people with vision loss and new technology that may be available to them good afternoon I think it is still, no, it's still morning. Good morning. Still morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. I'm going to start and then uh, Lisa will go right after. So I'm going to share my screen and great. And we'll do there. Perfect. So again, I'm Brian Walensky. I'm an optometrist and chief technology officer at Lighthouse Guild. Uh, we're going to go over some of the assistive technologies that we use here for people with vision loss or visually impaired. Um, what I want to start with, though, is that the, you know, the number of people in the United States who are blind or visually impaired is actually predicted to double by the year 2050. And while this is mostly due to aging eye disease, really eye disease and that causes vision loss can happen at any point in life. And you know, as an eye doctor, as an optometrist, as someone who wants to prevent vision loss, really it's important uh, to get an eye exam and have a, that comprehensive eye exam because sometimes, even in those early stages, eye disease can be asymptomatic and delaying treatment uh, to help prevent uh, vision loss could be a problem. Um, so getting a comprehensive eye exam could be just through your ophthalmologist and optometrist and they can do an eye exam and find early stages of certain eye diseases that cause vision loss, like glaucoma, macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and cataracts. 
Um, and if those things are found, timely referral to a specialist for monitoring or treatment can be made to an ophthalmologist, to a retina specialist, to a glaucoma specialist. You know, but different than it's important to see your specialist, your general eye care provider. However, if someone is having a functional visual complaint or any type of vision loss, it's really important to also include the low vision specialist. So many people confuse, well, I'm getting an eye exam, but why do I need to also see a low vision specialist? So low vision defined is a functional loss of vision uh, that can't be improved upon with regular conventional glasses, medication, or any types of surgery. So the low vision optometrist, like we have here at Lighthouse Guild, will evaluate the extent of that visual impairment, develop strategies to maximize the vision, the remaining vision that's there, to really meet the individual's goals. And that's to improve daily function of activities, increase someone's independence and quality of life. And today, that really includes assistive technologies. Now, assistive technology has, is not something new. You know, one of the earliest uh, forms of assistive technology is actually Braille typewriter in the 1800s. But uh, I wanted to bring up this one here. In 1914, there was the optophone. And there's a picture of it on the right with a gentleman with a big machine on a desk. And he's wearing a pair of headphones. And it, you put uh, text underneath it. And it emitted a sound for each letter. Now, someone read very slow. They read about one word per minute but it was the precursor to things to come for development. And in today's world, we have a lot of things to choose from. And not only that, a lot of things are accessible. Uh, our mainstream technologies are accessible with smartphones, tablets, and computers. They have all sorts of onboard accessibility options. Um, and for the future, we have computer vision, machine learning, and to come, which I know a lot of people talk about, which is artificial intelligence. Now, one of the most common complaints that we have during a low vision exam or having a functional vision problem is reading. And this is where magnification really comes in. Magnifiers for near, telescopes for distance, but just as important is also contrast of things. And I know Lisa will hit on that as well in one of her slides. Um, sunglasses, filters of different colors can really increase contrast and really help someone. So when it comes to technology though and magnification, we also have not have the regular optical magnifiers that we kind of know and see, but we also have a range of magnification, of increased ranges of magnification that could be done with electronic magnification, and that you're able to change colors and contrasts and really has some other benefits as well. So here I have um, a video which I'm going to play and explain as it goes. This is Dr. Um, Sparaza here at uh, Lighthouse Guild, who's a low vision optometrist. And she is showing a patient a desktop electronic magnification device, what we call a CCTV. And what's happening here is that uh, she's showing this system to the patient. The reading material is placed on a movable tray underneath a camera and is projected onto a large screen right in front of the user. The user can then set their own magnification for reading, uh, their preferred contrast, which we're showing on here, such as black on white, white on black, negative contrast, even yellow on blue, or the opposite. Uh, it can also be used, as Dr. Sparaz is going to show in a moment, for handwriting. So you can then read or see your own handwriting, maybe for writing checks or uh, writing a card or um, writing anything that way you can read it on there and also change the contrast, make it bigger, uh, making it easier to see for an individual. Some of these newer ones also have something called OCR or optical character recognition, where you can put a page right underneath it, take a picture, and it's going to read the screen, read everything that's on the screen right back to you. There's also portable forms of electronic magnification, so handheld electronic magnification devices. And these are more meant for spot reading, not really meant for reading a whole entire book, but again, people could use it for that, uh, depending on their goals and what they wanna use. And that, that's actually very important. It's really what works for you. And that's part of exploring and going through the low vision exam and also working possibly with, with one of our occupational therapists to do a technology evaluation is finding out what works for you. Well, in this video, what they showed is that you can use this 
device and you bring it to the text rather than putting it to the device and you're able to possibly go shopping, see a price, look at a menu because it's portable. You can change contrast. Here on the screen, it's showing negative contrast with white letters on a back background, black background. Uh, you can also take a photo of something and save it in some of these. And some of these also have speaking uh, capabilities as well. There's also wearable electronic magnification devices these days. And these do a whole, they're, they're, there's about more than a dozen on the market today. However, the one on the left utilizes a virtual reality headset and the gentleman is wearing that over his eyes and it uh, unfortunately takes away his peripheral vision. So this is not a device that you really can walk around with. So you shouldn't be on the streets with this walking around. It's mostly meant for sitting. You can magnify for reading. You can magnify for distance. And also that specific one, you could hook into a cable box and actually watch television in there in a magnified view. And some of these devices also, you can surf the web and make things bigger and change contrasts. The one on the right looks more like a conventional pair of guy glasses, maybe a little bit bigger. Uh, however, it's still not meant to walk around with these because um, you could lose sense of balance, and so it's better to sit with these th with these devices when they're when, when they're over your eyes. Uh, again, it's magnif it's two LED uh, screens right in front of your eyes, and it magnifies, changes brightness, changes contrast, and again, some of these can perform reading functions like OCR. Now today, our, as I mentioned earlier, our, you know we have accessibility features in our mainstream devices. You know, a computer screen that has a graphic user, user interface. You know, how is someone with a vision issue or vision problem or vision loss going to interact with that? Well, there's many different things and the different features that people could choose from. From magnification, they can make it larger. You can use screen readers like narrator or voiceover where it reads everything right off the screen. Uh, speech recognition or dictation, so you could speak and then have it write out for you. Large cursors or displays, you can change contrast. There's even keyboard customizations and shortcuts that you could do. And we now have even braille displays where the text can come out on a, on a braille. Uh, there's also other things, let's say the computer uh, systems accessibility features are not good enough for you that you want needed more. There's also external softwares out there that's called JAWS, Job Application with Speech, Zoot, which, which uh, is a screen reader, which speaks all the information on the screen, uh, and also you use keystrokes in order to navigate the screen. Zoom text, which again, just as it says, is zooming and changing contrast, and Fusion, which is really the marriage of JAWS and Zoom text. There's our iPhones and smartphones out there that have accessibility features. There's uh, voiceover, which speaks out what you're touching on the screen. You can zoom, you can use a magnifier, uh, you can uh, make the text bigger, uh, and something called spoken content, where it'll read the screen out for you. Now, some people could get a little overwhelmed with not even, with, well, one, just using a smartphone, but however, however, all the different accessibility options that are available on there. So it could get confusing in what's best for you. And it's really about trying it out. However, there are other options. We have other phone options, not just smartphones, but well, they are a smartphone. It's a smartphone with tactile buttons. Uh, you're able to use it as a screen reader so you can surf the internet. Uh, you ha it has voice control, but it has tactile buttons. So the one on the left is called Blind Shell. The one on the right is Real Sam Pocket where you just, want a basic phone, you just tap and speak, and that's it. Very simple. So there are other options than just the Android platform and the iOS platform out there with their accessibility options. And that's important to know. Now, there are a ton of apps out there. I have listed here a whole bunch of just, unfortunately, in, in, in images, um, but some cost, some are free. Uh, it really depends on what your needs are. Some of them are navigation. Some of them uh, can recognize people that recognize cash, um, can give you other information. Um, so it's just based on what you need or some read books so you can um, download books. Um, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to mention two, two specific ones. Uh, one is called Seeing AI, which is very useful. And the other one is Envision AI. Both of these are free apps. They're multifunctional meaning they read text, they recognize barcodes, people, currency, color, find objects, and describe scenes. So, I mean, the, our phones are very powerful for what it can do, and especially for a free app. 
It's important to note that the Seeing AI app is only on iOS. The Envision AI is iOS and Android. Um, but I took a picture of myself to see what the described scene would be. That's the artificial intelligence on board. And it said I was a 57-year-old man with brown hair, wearing glasses and looking happy. And there's a picture of me. I'm smiling. I'm wearing glasses. But my hair is gray, and I'm not 57. A little younger than that. But I took a picture of my uh, lamp, and it said it's, a, and it's on the right picture. It says it's probably a record player on a record player. So it's a lamp on my desk. So it's not perfect, but we're getting there. It, Envision AI has something called Envision Glasses, where somebody can actually use the app along with it. However, that does come in a charge. Another app that's important to, to mention is that let's say I'm in a pharmacy. So on the right, I have a blurred picture of a pharmacy, and I want to find the specific uh, item that I need, but no one's around there to help me. Pharmacist is busy. No one else is in the aisle. I can call one of these two services. One is Be My Eyes. The other one is Ira. They're sighted assistants. Be My Eyes is free. You call up. Someone's, uh, it's a volunteer. They see through your camera, and they give you assistance to find the uh, merchandise that you're trying to look for. Ira, however, is a subscription one, similar, but you're talking to a trained agent someone who knows how to describe things to you. So there are also devices without Wi-Fi, separate from our phones that we might want in case we are not utilizing Wi-Fi or in an area where we don't get it. So these are audio specific devices. They're just speaking the information to us, taking a picture and speaking the text. So the OrCam read, the lyric that's on here, um, both take a picture and speak the text, could get a whole page as well. Some are easier to use than others. It just depends on the individual. It works for them. And then on the bottom is the OrCam uh, My Eye, which uh, utilizes computer vision, takes a picture, and then is able to read, uh, recognize people, uh, barcodes, color, money, and um, more. So the next slide is even our smart home technology. That mainstream technology is so useful for our activities of daily living. Our Amazon, I won't say the A word in case everyone's home, the Apple Home. Google, and these devices can be very, very useful just to make things a little bit easier in our daily lives. Uh, if anyone wants more information um, about current technology, and we do a webinar every third Tuesday of the month called Tech Talk, and you can go on our website, www.lighthouse.org, and register for Tech Talk. And we have another podcast that's done by our CEO here, Dr. Cal Roberts, that is called it On Tech and Vision, and he really talks about big ideas for the future and what's coming in technologies for vision loss. Thank you very much. Uh, my email is walinski at lighthouse.org and phone number 212-769-6276. I'll put that in the chat and I will stop sharing and hand it over to Lisa for timing. Hi. I'm here. So in the interest of time, I will try to go as quickly as possible, but I will slow down for understandability. Okay, so my name is Lisa Beth Miller. I'm the Outreach and Referral Coordinator at Lighthouse Guild, and I'm going to share with you some resources for individuals who have low vision or blindness, starting with a little bit about eye health, talking about the impact of vision loss on people's lives, and then some programs and services. see. Here we go. Okay, so I always like to start out with things we can do, give ourselves a sense of agency. Here are some tips to protect your eyes. Have a comprehensive dilated eye exam, generally yearly, unless your doctor suggests more. Quit smoking or never start. Maintain your blood sugar levels, especially if you have diabetes, because diabetes puts you at high risk for vision loss. Know your family's eye history, whether someone in your family has macular degeneration or glaucoma, it can be helpful. You stay on top of it. Be cool and wear your shades. They really do help protect from the UV light. Give your eyes a rest. Sleeping clears out the toxins in our body, including those that interfere with vision. Eat right to protect your sight. There's a little icon over there with a lovely little carrot and green leafy vegetables and a pumpkin, brightly colored vegetables and fruits are good for all of us and especially good for your vision. 
clean your hands and contact lenses properly. We all learned this during COVID, especially, but at all times, it makes a difference to wash it and over and over. Wear protective eyewear whenever possible. Okay, so vision and aging. There are normal changes in vision. We've all come to know this to some degree, and those include difficulty reading mail, newspapers, problems with glare. These and other changes may indicate serious problems. They may be simple signs of aging or serious problems like glaucoma or diabetic retinopathy, and lay people cannot know. Only an eye doctor can tell us. This is the slide that Brian Walensky suggested I would talk about, low vision difficulties. Okay, you see the taxi, and then you see this big blotch of gray space. It's not that easy to see that this is actually a staircase because contrast between the top step and the lower step is blended. That's a bit what it's like to have problems with contrast sensitivity perception. So you can see that the lines are blurred. Other difficulties from low vision include recognizing a familiar face, reading print, perceiving contrast as mentioned, seeing obstacles such as curbs and steps. Sometimes that can lead to a fall and people don't know or think that maybe there's a change in vision. That could be the case. Managing medication or traveling independently, especially at night with night vision changes. So here are, here's a few of the impacts of vision loss on independent living reading mail, medication, food labels, and newsprint, writing a check for you to pay your bills, dialing a telephone, shopping for groceries, preparing for meals and cooking, participating in hobbies and activities, travel and mobility, crossing streets, reading street signs and bus signs, driving a car, recognizing faces, socializing, work and school, Vision impairment can hinder using a computer, using a tablet or phone, reading and writing, traveling to and from work and school, losing a job, income, dignity, dependent on strangers, and also mental health. Individuals may feel depressed, isolated, embarrassed, anxious, and abandoned. Rehabilitation is a part of good care. And just to mention something that I thought of also while listening to Jeff Wax before, is that when we have an, a problem with our functioning, whether it's hearing or vision loss, it can affect our mental health or our moods, and that can affect our hearing or our vision. So it's called bidirectionality, and each can, can affects the other. Our vision loss can affect our mood, and our mood can affect our vision. So here I'll talk a little bit more about services. So the most important takeaway I wanna start with is to connect to services, it's very easy. Here are the phone numbers, the health center and my number. As the outreach and referral coordinator, I'm very happy to talk about programs both at Lighthouse Guild and beyond and resources. And I also directly connect people to register for the New York State Commission for the Blind whenever they're eligible. These phone numbers you'll get in, in the, when you get the information at the end. Um, but also it's really important to just be practical. If you have this information, you can call me and I will point you in the right direction wherever that may take you. So when is it time to seek services or make a referral for someone in the neighborhood or a neighbor or a client? Whenever someone has significant complaints about difficulties with activities of daily living, if they complain about contrast, difficulties reading labels that have gray on gray, or night vision, feeling anxiety, depression, or hopelessness, if some doctor said you have legal blindness that's 20 over 200 or less in the better eye, individuals who have not had a physical or eye exam within the past year or have been diagnosed by an eye doctor with an eye condition and don't yet have any symptoms. Also, if you would like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation on immediate needs and resources, I welcome callers. So Lighthouse Guild's health center services include low vision optometry, which was described beautifully by Dr. Walensky, primary care physicians, 
endocrinology, podiatry, occupational therapists to try the different technology out and to make sure people are, don't buy things that are not useful for them, either because they're too complicated or they're just not what they need. Guild care, adult day health care, I'll say a little bit more about all of these, the behavioral health, and also our new eye care, eyewear, eyeglass shop, which actually provides funding for our services to some, you know, contributes to the funding for our services. So here's a wonderful resource, Guild Care Adult Day Health Care. It's services available to adults 18 and older who've been diagnosed with a chronic medical condition. It's at the level of care which provides an alternative to people going into a nursing home where they need much, much more support. This allows people to remain home and have a program where they're helped and monitored by a nurse. We have centers for guild care in not only Manhattan serving five boroughs, but also Albany, Buffalo, and Niagara Falls. There's a team of licensed professionals, including a nurse doing medication management, morning snack and noon meals, social and therapeutic groups for activities, and also a vision rehab specialist who can help people in the slow adjustment to vision loss and adapting. Behavioral health services. We are the only behavioral health center in the United States, cert especially certified and focused on people who are blind, visually impaired, or at risk for vision loss. We have psychiatrists, they do medication management. We have individual psychotherapy, family therapy. We have group therapy and we have, these sessions are in person or telehealth by phone or Zoom. All of that has been possible since COVID. Our technology is really the apple of our eye. It's a premier assistive technology resource at Lighthouse Guild, offers a one-stop resource for vision care, rehab and tech training. We have assessments by OTs to see that people get what they need based on their visual capacity, their lifestyle, their personal goals, and comfort with technology. There's opportunity to try out and learn how to use cutting edge and basic tech devices. And there are many solutions, as Dr. Walensky just described, um, in technology, in um, all kinds of devices, wearable devices, specialized eyeglasses, magnifiers, CCTVs, computers, and smart home technology. Support groups. Telesupport groups are held by licensed clinical staff. We have parent support groups. We have adult telesupport groups for 35 and older. We have young adult telesupport groups for ages 19 to 34 where they're at a specific life stage, and also high schoolers, ninth and 10th graders meet separately from 11th and 12th graders. We have youth services, Saturday youth program for ages six to 13. We have a Saturday youth transition program for ages 14 to 21, and a summer pathways program for ages 14 to 21. Volunteer reader services for all ages. Volunteers read a wide variety of personal, academic, and professional material in print and online. Most of these services are being held still at Lighthouse Guild, but we do have capacity for some volunteers to go to people's homes to help them read through their mail and things like that. Vision and Voc Rehab services. We, we have many services are paid for through the New York State Commission for the Blind for those eligible. These are independent living skills program and adaptive living program, that, which are very seri uh, similar, just depending on the age group, and also voc rehab services. Adaptive living program is for the older adults, 55 and older, that are not interested in employment. The independent living skills for for those 55 and under and also 55 and older include training and household tasks and orientation and mobility training, which is basically white sight cane training and learning how to use public transportation safely, outdoor mobility and indoor mobility. Voc rehab services, which is for people that want to keep employment or return to the workforce. They include not only the low vision services, also social casework, counseling, academic instruction, assistive technology training, and work readiness and career services. We have an amazing program called Tech Pals that has just been extended. It's very exciting because young adults, 18 to 24, who are themselves blind or visually impaired, have been specially trained to teach older adults, 55 and older, how to, that have vision loss, how to use their smartphones, tablets, and iPhones. 
also just to, to, to uh, bring us to a close, um, we have wonderful programs online at the e-learning tab on our website. This provides different courses for professionals. These are trainings on helping professionals specifically with their vision impaired and blind clients. That includes a special presentation by our psychiatrist, Dr. Cesar Alfonso, and that for behavioral health, other behavioral health specialists, including social workers, psychiatrists, also programs for occupational therapists, ophthalmologists, and optometrists. I encourage all people that are interested, including lay people, to check some of these free programs out and do a little learning. Take what you can use and leave the rest. It can never hurt to just keep learning. So to, to close, Lighthouse Guild is here to help people manage life with vision loss. Here's my contact info, which I know you'll, will be shared again. I thank you sincerely for hearing this presentation, and I hope it's been useful. Thank you so much. So thank you, Lisa and Brian, and thank you to all of our presenters. And we're going to be starting out with the Q&A section. I just want people to let to know that we got many questions before we even got the presentations today and i'm not sure i've seen in any webinar that we've done this many questions coming in through the q a and chats so i know for a fact we're not going to get through all the questions but i do want to highlight something that i think should be clear to everyone for both hearing issues and vision issues People don't even realize sometimes that they're actually suffering from these issues because they come on gradually. And when things come on gradually, you may not even realize how much you've lost as far as hearing or vision. And so I just wanna urge everyone who is watching today and listening today, if you think that anything has been changing in your vision or your hearing, please, go out and have some kind of follow-up testing, whether it's through an audiologist, as we learned from our friends from the Hearing Center, whether it's your own doctor, whether it's a vision specialist, particularly as we're aging, I don't, everyone's vision changes. I think pretty much it's fair to say everyone's vision changes. And you may not even realize how many things you have stopped doing or stopped being able to do, and you just say, well, I'm getting older. Well, yes, we're all getting older. That doesn't mean there's not options available to us, and it doesn't mean that there's not underlying medical issues that, in fact, you really need to find out about and address because it can radically improve your life and also prevent other things from happening once you learn what's going on. So I obviously we're going to be sending everybody all the resources discussed today and more information about these two terrific not-for-profit organizations that offer, my goodness, far more services and options than I actually realized. But really mostly whether you got an answer today or not, just think about the need to have yourself checked out and make sure um that there is something you could be doing that you didn't know i for example just went and had a vision test and learned that you know and it's and it's appropriate for, technically for my age i have cataracts and they're like oh you have like real cataracts and you're going to see so much better um when you get these taken care of and i was thrilled i just actually thought you get to certain ages and you know, even though you go and have your eyes checked all the time, you know, best vision starts to go away. And it does, but it's also it's like, yes, if you have like a serious cataract issue, um, that could absolutely be addressed. So my own experience, I went to the hearing center a few years ago and learned that I actually did have some hearing issues and I've been wearing hearing aids in crowded big um, areas now for several years they come in really handy on the floor of the senate when i'm trying to debate and hear my colleague from across the senate chamber they come in really handy when i'm in a conference room with 75 people talking at each other 
um, and also restaurants. So, you know, I've sort of, I've taken advantage of the services of both types of organizations. And so I feel like I can be witness from my own experience about how valuable it is to make sure you are doing your own follow up on your own behalf. With that, I'm going to start with some of the questions. And as I've explained before to our guests, whoever thinks they have an answer to that question, just jump on in. And if no one has an answer, then we call it stump the experts and we will try to follow up with um, answers prior to, you know, or we'll try to get those answers out to you in writing. Um, one of the concerns is about cost, I think, particularly around hearing aids. Um, so do audiologists have to actually tell you how much a specific hearing aid device is going to cost before you, you actually agree to buy them? I guess some people have had experiences where they have sticker shock after they've already um, gotten the hearing aid or signed up for it. So... Um... I'll just answer that. <laughs> um, audiologists, it's a New York state law that you do have to have the information disclosed and a purchase agreement outlining the um, the cost, what the cost is for, and your trial period. So yes, on a side note, even if it wasn't a law, they definitely should tell you before they want you to purchase and agree to. <laughs> so if an audiologist is asking you to purchase without letting you know the cost or your cost options, I would just be aware of that. That's that's not necessarily um, the the goal for an audiologist. An audiologist is really should be getting you to hear well, and and so they should always be uh, honest with what they're offering you and what options are available. And I know it was mentioned that unfortunately Medicare is not covering um, hearing aids, and I'm just want to double check. I think both for vision and hearing aids. So. There are lots and lots of different Medicare Advantage programs on the market that promise all kinds of supplemental benefits on different issues. Um, we always advise everyone, you know, try to use a navigator, really try to figure out what it is that you know you need in healthcare and double check that you're signing up for the right program for you if you're going down that road. Um, do either, from a hearing perspective or a vision perspective, either have any opinions about sort of different kinds of Medicare Advantage programs and how they may be of more or less assistance to you if you have special needs for hearing or vision. So some uh, Medicare Advantage plans do have a third party payer for hearing aids or um, a third party that provides discounted hearing aid costs. And they don't necessarily come automatically. You would have to sign up for them through some of the third parties. Um, and AARP recently in November actually joined with a third party, uh, so the supplemental, in order to be able to provide that. So it, it's important when you are getting hearing aids that you actually ask the audiologist or the center you're purchasing from to verify your hearing aid coverage. And there are lots of questions about the prices of hearing aids. And I think you did highlight in your presentation that some of the over-the-counter options are actually quite a bit less expensive than the more traditional hearing aids, but that you really do need to have an evaluation of your hearing done to make sure that those options are actually going to work for you. And on, on eye care, mostly the... I guess the more expensive costs would be covered under health insurance. Is that correct? I would say that glasses are generally covered 80% by Medicare. Sometimes the supplemental will cover some of the rest of it. Sometimes it depends on the plans. And also sometimes they just say no only every two years, but then you can advocate if you've had severe changes in your vision. So, um, and if you're the person's eligible for services through the New York State Commission for the Blind, anything that the insurance covered uh, coverage does not do cover, um, that program will cover if they've been registered with the New York State Commission for the Blind. So there's a lot of workarounds and it's always good to have a conversation about it in advance so you know what you're doing. And Senator, if, oh, go ahead, please. Senator Kruger, if I can just add to the, 
to this discussion. Uh, in my services for counseling or psychotherapy, it is covered by insurance, most plans. I try to make that so, even if the plan says no, I don't want anybody to be uh, not get services. Uh, so we, we accept in, in uh, my department, we accept most all insurance plans um, and of course self-pay. Oh. And I was so, oh, please go ahead. Sorry, Dr. I wanted to mention one thing on gla glasses, vision. So usually it would be covered under a supplemental, like a vision plan, um, if it, someone has one. If it doesn't, Medicare uh, really does not cover glasses, uh, nothing with lenses, uh, only one time after cataract surgery, and they must be a provider. Just wanted to add that in. Great. Thank you. And I just want to add how I'm glad I was to hear that both of your organizations are providing mental health services and support groups because I certainly know I have a dear friend whose father lost his complete vision later in life and frankly just refused any suggested help or things that he could do to learn to deal with losing his sight. And it was so sad to everyone in his family because he would not consider any of the options that really not only would have improved his quality of life for a good additional decade, but also really helped if his the family knew about these services then, really help his family learn to deal with the issues that, you know, that he was bringing to the table, so to speak. So I'm, I'm very glad that there is now this direct tie in between, you know, a physical issue that we all confront different ones in our lives and the impact on the person's mental health and their loved one's um, mental health. So I'm very, very glad to learn about the programs and supports that are available. Um, okay, so OTC hearing aids over the counter. So do we actually think that they can be as good as the usually far more expensive options um, is there people are there people who are really sort of doing comparison reviews because a number of questions relate to there's lots and lots of advertising on tv um on over the counter and you just you know some of them are just a couple hundred bucks and some of them i think as was said range up to two thousand dollars which is still dramatically less than many of the more traditional um hearing aids like how do we actually know who to trust when it comes to what decision we're making a lot of questions <laughs> but uh there are there have been studies started now since they um, became available what we're seeing is they actually are helping people with just a mild loss so somebody who's just noticing some difficulty um you know, the more advanced over the counter, which will do some filtering of background noise and will be able to stream from a cell phone is $2,000 for a pair. You can get a basic hearing aid with basic technology that will filter background noise and uh, pair through a cell phone and have an audiologist actually program them specifically for your hearing loss for that cost, um, especially at a center like ours, like CHC. Um, technology level is what changes the cost of the hearing aids. The higher the level, the the higher the cost that it will be. Um, so who to trust? You know, often I say hearing aids are only as good as the person who programs them. And so you want to go, uh, like I said in the presentation, to a nonprofit organization, a a, a, uni a teaching university, a hospital, places that aren't necessarily doing it for the profit. Um, unfortunately, there isn't much regulation on the cost of hearing aids and where you purchase can affect the cost. Gosh. And then also in the presentation from the hearing center was a reference to tinnitus. And in preparation for this morning, I decided to go online and look at some of the over the counter um, products. And they give you a little questionnaire and they ask whether or not you have tinnitus. And if you answer no, you just keep going. I didn't think to answer yes. Would that have meant that it would have said, no, this isn't, you aren't eligible and you need to do something else? So can you explain what we mean when we say tinnitus? Sure. It's um, any kind of ringing, buzzing or noise in the ears, rushing, hissing, 
uh, can be constant, both ears or one ear. And, you know, everyone has that here and there ringing, but that's not what they mean. Um, it's a constant situation and you are not a candidate for over-the-counter hearing aids if you have tinnitus. You're not allowed to go further. You typically will need to see an audiologist and have a medical workup so they can make sure that there isn't any physical cause. Um, and then over-the-counter hearing aids don't really address, um, address it, but uh, prescription hearing aids can. There are uh, tinnitus maskers and matchers in prescription hearing aids. At CHC, we do have a tinnitus retraining therapy program. Um, if you go to our website, you'd be able to actually click on the, that portion and get information, or you can send an email to info at chchearing.org. Um, um, but because you, there are specific audiologists who are trained in dealing with tinnitus, but over-the-counter does not address them, and you are not a candidate. Got it. Okay. And then one more hearing specific question. A number of people wrote in about how they have severe hearing loss in just one ear. I guess there are a variety of reasons that might have occurred. So are they eligible to use hearing aids, I guess, just in the one bad ear versus the not needing one in the good ear? Right. So let's start first. Over the counter hearing aid, you would not be a candidate for. It has to be at this point um, the same in both ears because there's no medical involvement. If you have severe hearing loss in one ear, you may be a hearing aid candidate. There's actually a lot of options at, at this point for somebody who has a loss in only one ear. What, there are specific different types of hearing aids. And there are some people who are actually getting cochlear implants, which is the surgical uh, implantation. Uh, that bypasses the inner ear for a severe to profound hearing loss in one ear that is allowed at this point. Got it. So definitely you should see an audiologist or an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Great. And now jumping to more of the vision questions. Um, so I, th and I think you did say this, but we'll just make sure. So does the Lighthouse Center um, have people who can help train us in the various devices and options available? Yes. Good. Oh, That's what I thought you said. So Lisa mentioned our Tech Pals program. Yes, so these are younger individuals, mentors who uh, are trained to teach other individuals. They are, are visually impaired themselves, and they're teaching the tech that they use uh, to seniors. Uh, so it's a great program. It's a great intergenerational uh, program that we have, as well as um, we have occupational therapists, as well as programs that go through for um, vocational rehabilitation who are part of the New York State Commission for the Blind. Great. And doctor, you were going over apps that might be on your phone or computer and help. Um, so here's a question specific to someone who has both vision loss and arthritis. So mm -hmm. are there specific, you know, apps or technologies that might be helpful if you've got limitations in being able to type or write into a device as well as vision issues? So the, there, there are, there's a number of them out there. Actually, a lot of the computers and even phones, they have it already built into the device. There's other third party apps as well as a lot of them. I mean, I could probably arrange some in a, in a, in a maybe a uh, post or something. Maybe I should do that. That would be, that would actually be helpful because some of them you gotta be careful, won't uh, do, they might say speech to text, but they don't necessarily do your speech. It'll take like a presentation or something else and put it to text rather than your own voice. So you have to be careful in what you're purchasing. Great. Thank you. Um, Someone's saying that there's a very long waiting list for vision services um, to get help. One, I don't know that I was aware of that, but is there a waiting list for services in your agency? Oh, definitely. Um, I would say, you know, right now it's because one of our veteran uh, specialists, low vision optometrists who trained so many doctors has just finally retired at an advanced age, a robust man, but, um, we are looking for a replacement for that. And also, I mean, the whole healthcare system is kind of inundated with people coming out of the woodworks, getting their doctor appointments after COVID. And there's a lot of activity, but I know that everybody here is trying to do as much as they can to move those things forward. And, you know, we're trying to be as efficient as possible. There is a little bit of a wait, 
But in the meantime, I always send people my resource email so that they can start to learn about some of the other tools and techniques and programs they can start to learn about as they await for their appointment. And do you have any kind of referral service to other do doctors in private practice or in other locations that if people are looking for a vision specialist? I think generally we refer people to the met to the wonderful medical centers in the C New York City area that cover ophthalmology. And there are many wonderful eye centers for ophthalmology, which is the medical treatment of the eyes, because our focus is on vision function for the low vision special glasses, magnifiers, and things you want to do like read and crochet. Right. Now, back in the past, I remember before you merged two organizations into one, um, the lighthouse that was in my district on 59th Street had a store people could go to to look at the newer technologies and find things that they thought that would work for them. Do you still have such a store? So I'll take that one. We don't necessarily know have a store anymore. We're really a uh -huh. medical and vision uh, organization. So based on a low vision assessment and then an occupational therapy assessment, they're finding out what are the best devices or technologies or services that this individual needs, and then given the resources of where to get those. So we don't really have a store per se to browse in. Everyone's getting everything online these days too. So uh, a lot of the talking watches and things from the past, because now our phones do that as well. If people right. want to do that, those are readily available online. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. I'm assisting a blind gentleman to learn more about technology, but he finds technology challenging. Um, I would like to know about assistance devices that are easy to use, um, particularly for people who may never sort of master the technology of smartphones, et cetera. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge for everyone. Uh, what works for one person doesn't work for the other. And some of these tech, new technologies can be complicated. Even a smartphone can be complicated with vision. Uh, it's, it, it, it's a hard thing to tackle. That's why we have our Tech Pals program, which is great. And a lot of people love that uh, because it's really peer to peer as well. Uh, it's getting the youth to help seniors and try to match that up and, and teaching them how to teach not just say, you know, some, some kids go this and this and this, and then you basically don't hear anything. And, you know, anywhere you're out the other, they go too fast. You have right. to know how the process and what works for one person doesn't another. So we find a way. Um, there are resources out there for that. And really it's about having a technology assessment, which is what we do here uh, with low vision Ooh. doctors and low vision and vision loss specialists. And then making those recommendations based on the person's lifestyle, their goals, who they are, we're all different. We're all experiencing that journey differently. Thank you. Well, I've actually gone over time. I knew we would have way too many questions. So I'm now going to quickly close us up. I want to thank everyone who participated today, Alberto, Carolyn, Michelle, Jeff, Lisa, and Brian for sharing great information. And I also want to thank our sign language interpreter who's been going full steam ahead the entire almost two hours. Um, our next virtual event is scheduled for Wednesday, July 12th from 10 to 1130, and that will be with the New York City Department of Health, who will provide information about healthy homes, including how to address mold and pest infestations and how to clean your home safely. Again, thank you to my staff for making this all happen. Thank you to our guests. And again, everyone who's on that we have an email for. Um, we'll be getting follow-up information with contact information and the incredible resources that our guests were talking about today. And with that, I'm going to wish everyone a great rest of the week and thank you all for participating. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.